Drew Hendricks here. I'm the guest host today for We Fixed Real Estate. Today I've got Fred Glick and Renee Perez. Welcome to the show, guys. <laughs> Howdy, what's happening? We are we are just talking about how much energy we have. This is this yes, is, we do. This is going to be an adrenaline-filled podcast. So let's see what what's up, guys. What's up? Okay, well, everybody's been kind of digesting the real estate lawsuit stuff with realtors and every one of the brokerages that are franchises that you can imagine, Compass, Coldwell Banker, Remax, Keller Williams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's only been one deal where they've actually had a conviction, and that's in uh, the... I forget where it is, Missouri, I think it was. I, I Don't quote me on that. But it took the jury three hours to decide that all these agents should pay back $1.8 billion. One lawsuit, $1.8 billion. And from what I hear, they can get triple damages for some reason. So it's like, it's almost $6 billion. It's like, that's amazing. what are they getting back? Well, what they did was they, they would go in... There's two sides of this as a buyer and a seller. As a buyer, what they would do and say, don't worry about the commission, the seller's paying. Well, of course the seller's paying, but also it comes out on the sale price of the house. So actually the buyer is paying it in the long run, in the reality. Okay, that's problem number one. Number two basically was they lied to sellers. They said, you have to put a buyer broker fee uh, because and it and nor made it a requirement in their MLSs and the MLSs all made it a requirement. And the requirement was you had to put at least a dollar, but you couldn't put zero. Mm -hmm. So the court said, like, I, I mean, the the jury said, like, no, no, dude, you don't have to. So here's what's going to happen from all this. It, there's not going to be like one day it's all going to change. This is just going to start to change. Like for example, Ariva doesn't require anybody to put anything for a buyer broker. We've done it with a dollar, basically said, you know, hey, buyer agent, you know, you get it from your buyer. Okay, so get it from your buyer is an important thing. So right now, today, obviously, you go to us and we have the rebate over the two and a half percent. But what if there's nothing? Mm -hmm. You owe us the money because we're doing the work and all that. But you'd like to be able to not pay it to us. You know, maybe you want to roll it into the mortgage. So. There's actually a way on the contract in California that allows and tells the seller, hey, you know, X amount of dollars is actually going towards commission. And so you're not really getting that much. If it's a million dollars, $10,000 commission, it's a million, $10,000 contract. Then there's a form they have to coordinate with this that basically explains it to the mortgage company. So, but it still has to appraise for the million ten thousand dollars, which it will ninety nine percent of the time. It's not going to make that much of a difference. So, there's a process now to have the seller paying your uh, costs for your buyer broker fee. Um, what so that if, also so might it's lead a dollar, to is so if it's a dollar and the house is a million dollars, would the house be one million one dollar? No, 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 no. no, no. The point. Let's follow this again. I'm the buyer, or uh -huh. you're the buyer. Uh -huh. Let's say you're the buyer. You come to me and we say, okay, you have to pay us $9,750. Uh -huh. So we go to property A. The seller's offering 2.5% of the sale price, $25,000. Okay. So you make an offer of a million dollars, and then they pay us the $25,000, and then you get everything over $9,750. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this case, if they they're only pay us the dollar, that means you owe us $9,749 because the seller is paying us a dollar. Mm -hmm. Got it? I get so, it from the buying side, but from the selling side. Selling side, I'm, and hey, you're, you want to sell your house. You want to get a million dollars for it. You're mm -hmm. going to pay us $15,750 to do our listing, and we're going to do all the work, and you can read at areva.com slash sellers to show what we do. Um but then you go out and we put it on Redfin and all Zillow and everywhere else. And the buyers come to us. And when they make an offer and they accept an offer is accepted, we don't pay their buyer broker anything. Mm -hmm. Their buyer, buyer has to pay their buyer broker something. Now, here's why you need a buyer broker mm -hmm. in California. Uh, I'm going to put it this way. You can't be your own buyer broker. 
And here's the system because the system has locked you out. Number one, you don't have access to the multiple listing service, which you must be licensed and under a brokerage to get. And in there, they have agent to agent notes. They have disclosure forms. They have a whole bunch of other information that's not public. Mm -hmm. You can't get that. So let's say even if you could get it, you got a friend who's an agent, he's happy to just give it to you. Second problem is you can't make an offer. Why? Because the offer has to be on this California Association of Realtor form that you can only get if you're licensed and you pay a fee. Mm-hmm. And under the fee, under the contract for uh, that, if you're a realtor or not, you're not allowed to just give it out because, mm-hmm. and they could pull the licensing for it. So you got to use somebody. So What's going to develop, and I can see us developing this in the future, is something where, and oh, and by the way, you can't take the forms and do an API and automate it so it fills in the blanks. Somebody yeah. has to sit there and type it in within this stupid zip forms online software. So that's what makes it even more ridiculous because they will sue you for your license if you do it in the automated fashion. Mm-hmm. I was just saying. So they're sticking to the 1960s. You do everything their way or the highway. Will this change? Who knows? But that's the way it is right now. So you do need somebody to represent you. And you might as well because, you know, there's there, there's negotiations involved. Yeah. And that's what we do. And that's things you don't see and we can't put on websites. And if you check our reviews, it'll kind of give you a, a, an idea. And, you know, having said that, and nobody really knows this. So, Rene, why don't you tell people what you do? Because it'd be really interesting. We can't really put this in writing, but he does a whole bunch of stuff. And he's like a pricing savant too. Pricing savant. <laughs> Renee, that's, a, yes. that's, a, that's a pretty loaded question. Like, what do I do? <laughs> what do well, you do? Well, for a buyer <laughs> broker and why, why they should use us and the, the well, difference of things. About, talk about the contracts, right? And, you know, and, and, and I've, I've heard it from people, you know, that are experienced and they've done five, six different properties. And they say they, they really already know what they're going to offer and et cetera, et cetera. I think that regardless of you having a lot of knowledge and being ex- an experienced buyer or seller, at the end of the day, like you, you are also trying to, or you should be, even if you're not trying to, you should be trying to get a second pair of eyes because there is a, um, I don't want to call it friendship, but an alliance or an agent to agent, right? Sellers and buyers. They won't get the information directly or more truthfully than when, when the person that you're dealing with on the phone is an agent or even in person. I've had it where agents that won't even answer your, your phone or the emails, you go to one of their open houses and they're a completely different person. But, and I think, and I think that's as much as I sometimes hate it because it does kind of get into the gap of, you know, being a salesperson, you know, the, the, the idea, I mean, even when we get our license. You know, and obviously there's a real estate broker's license and a real estate salesperson license. I don't really like the name of salesperson license because it's like, it's our title to be salespeople. But the reality is that if you are uh, actually trying to help a buyer, you do function more as an actual consultant because you're doing comparables as to how much the house would be um, be sold for. You're doing the calls to other agents and it's like, hey, how did the house next door sell for? Uh, even, I mean, even today this morning, right? Like we were working with um, a house in, in Berkeley and it was on Terrace Drive. It's like, okay, well, what do you know? Like we've actually already worked with uh, buyers and sellers uh, in that same street. So uh, ha- having the knowledge of like, okay, six, eight months ago, there was four offers and we, there was a, a counter offer system. Someone that is experienced in selling before, they don't know that context of that particular sale. So I think that's the value add-on of an agent, an agent that's actually trying to help you. It's not someone that just read a book and is actually just writing the contracts. It's someone that really does have the 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 bandwidth to look at that in specific property. And they're they're all just kind of case to case. So I can't really tell you how much is, how much one property is going to go for because I've seen it time and time again where uh, a total fixer is going to go higher than the one next door that is fully renovated because the, the house next door sold four months ago. And now there's 10 people that still want that same property in that same block. Because, I mean, we label it as school, school, schools, but 
it's not even really about the schools, right? Uh, I think it's more about people that have been uh, outpriced and they're tired of not having a house where they can just live in and they want to show their parents and their kids to just have a house. So uh, the whole idea that it's about schools or about a street, yes, it's important, but at, there's there's fatigue of uh, people just wanting to move somewhere. So I um, yeah. just ranted there a bit and. Well, yeah, it is one thing I'll just throw on top of that is what people think, what buyers think is you're just negotiating with the seller. So I want this price. I want to do this contingency, blah, blah, blah. But you're not. You're competing most of the time against other buyers. And other buyers who've been through the, the wrecking ball for two years. And we've had those. We have those buyers. Mm-hmm. Like they get it. You know, as high a price as you can get. No contingencies, settle as quick as you can. You know, maybe even a swing loan to get it to a cash deal and close quick. And that's it. That's it. There's nothing else. You know, we had these guys come in. I bought 10 houses and I know how to negotiate. Like, dude, you're wasting your time because it's all about my favorite word. My favorite word in life. D-O-N-T-E-X-T. Context. No, that was in mine. There was a helicopter. There's always helicopters at the beach. I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, context. It's like context mm-hmm. of each sale, context of who else is bidding. But yeah, if you remember, you're competing against other people and not the seller. That's, that's the way to bid. Uh, I think if there's context, nobody else. That context is so important. And Renee, is that how, you, I mean, that's where the savant comes in and that you have the context that the yeah, I mean, sense. so, so, I mean, there's, there's been times where it's like, okay, how did that house, like, why did that house sell for much less before? And, and, and yeah, using the context of like, okay, well, the, unfortunately the sellers had cancer, but then they had to just sell it quickly. Well, in that case, yeah, if you're a cash buyer, you submit ASAP, you can get a deal. Boom. It's a bit cynical, but that's kind of where like the deals and submitting quickly goes into effect. Um, sometimes, it, I mean, and we got all type of buyers, right? Who they want to use their own strategy. And I think that every strategy does have a, a function in our bidding process and it can be successful, but yes, context of how you're going to bid that in that particular scenario is going to be important. So it's like most of the time, and you know, I, I, I've lost a good amount of deals as well from like thinking that it's going to be incredibly much lower. Um, I mean, once you're above the context as well, right? Once you're above like the $4 million, $5 million mark, you realize, well, um, there's not a lot of houses sold nearby. So what context do I use? Mm-hmm. You're, it's also kind of bidding in the air, right? Because yeah. there's a house being sold well, for eight months. So The other mistake on the quote unquote normal houses where we have multiple bids is that people think there's going to be a second round. Oh, the seller's going to come back. No, we had one the other day where... I forget. Now I'll make up a number. It was listed at a million three and it, you know, we knew it would go for at least a million four and our buyer and okay, I'll give him a little bit over list. And it ended up like the agent said, okay, basically we got our doors blown in by a cash buyer and there's going to be no second round. It's over. This was too good a, a deal to give up. So I always say to my buyers, go in first offer highest and best. Cause here's the other thing you're buying this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you paid 25 grand more than you should have per se, or in your mind, you should have. In 20 years, 25 grand isn't going to matter. The second thing about, especially in Northern California is they ain't building more houses. Meta, Google, et cetera, they ain't going nowhere. So guess what? It's called supply and demand. People want to live there. People love living there. People building routes. No, I have a buy. I'm moving into San Francisco. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll kind of add a, a point there to kind of disagree with Fred, though, because there's there always to be a nuance there on the because I mean, it, and this is something that people and buyers do disagree with all the time, and it's because text is lost in translation. Because Fred, you always says, you know, bid the highest and best, and if you get it, you get it; if you don't, you don't. The the, the problem with there is that people don't realize that what Fred is really trying to say is that based on the context of what the comps say and the added emotion, bid a number where you wouldn't necessarily go um, above, but that you know has a chance, right? Where like that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, it's like, yeah, like people and buyers, like I'm never going to tell some buyer to bid 2 million if we just think it's going to go way above asking. It's like, okay, as a buyer, okay, um, agent, 
why are you trying to make me bid X amount? And well, that's where I come in and I tell you, you're bidding this because there's a layer of, of ma the math involved and the emotion attached to it. And then I know that there's more offers. Sometimes it's hard to tell there's more than one offer, but sometimes it's really easy to find out. You know, you yeah, sometimes these agents send us a thing. They say, we have 30 packages downloaded, 11 people are saying they're going to make offers. I mean, that's a beginning to it, but yeah. I mean, you can't really believe in that all the time. But sure. I mean, you know, I mean, it's um, people I think are, in, in, uh, at least in our market where um, it's it's really still really active. You have 50 people at the open houses still. Uh, it's uh, on Thursday, it's in the market. By Tuesday, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You know that you have to be aggressive. If the house has been in the market, oh, one thing that I kind of want to mention then, you know, people always ask is the idea that, oh, well, it's 40 days in the market, we submit an offer and somehow there's another offer. Well, okay. As a listing agent, if you're a good agent, as, as soon as you get one offer, you go and show up mm. uh, with other buyers that have been uh, kind of just driving and just waiting on something you can offer. So my job as a listing agent is to make sure that I can get the most for my sellers, right? Mm -hmm. So it just makes sense that as soon as someone submits, someone else submits. And that's where you get the scenario where every time that you submit an offer, it, when a house that you think is kind of dead, it gets multiple offers is because everybody just, was just waiting to see how long it would take or if they can get it for less price. And that just generates a bidding there because there are people that don't really need to sell, that don't really need to buy, but they are in interested in the house. Mm -hmm. so. If you want a multiple bid, uh, just make sure to get, have a good agent. Then even though you have one offer, they go to reach out to everyone else. Yeah, that that's a super important thing to think about. Like I, sometimes I look at those houses that are on the market for 40, 60 days. I go, look, there's no interest. But you might have a couple dozen people sitting on the sidelines all waiting for yeah. the first mover. Yep. Some idiot. To, I mean, the sellers are idiots. Still. They just price it because they want they think it's worth it. I had a woman tell me back in Pennsylvania, well, you know, I bought it for this and inflation is this much. So I just took that number and now it's worth this. No, it doesn't work that way, lady. And I see the house has been on the market for a year now. So you're out of your mind. You know, don't waste your time. Well, uh, I think it's a perfect time for you to reach out and educate the sellers. But I think I think she didn't get it. Yeah. I can guarantee, I can, I can guarantee, uh, I'm talking to you here both, that if I, t I would talk to this woman, I would be able to kind of have her understand. And she would maybe give us some context as to like why she wouldn't sell at the lower price. So she obviously doesn't need the money either. Not the thing. You know, if people, you know, this idea that people don't need the money, it's kind of, there's kind of a, 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 a twisted kind of lie to this because if you don't need the money, then why are you selling? Then just keep it there empty. You want to put it could be an emotional coffee. thing or it's a, it's, it's a an guy, emotional they got, thing. And they got something better to do with the money once they get it. Yeah, you may have all the money in the world, but if you can save a dollar or a hundred dollars off. Yeah, and they do it 10 percent more exchange. You got that thing or you sold it for what it was worth. By the way, this has been crazy the last month. We've gotten a couple of 1031s. They just started popping up with us. It's been a lot, it's been a lot of fun with them. But hey, 1030, if you're doing a 1031 exchange. We can rebate you the money that you can get after closing that's not part of the exchange. So it's just free money for an exchange. Oh, yeah. And what they have what 90 days or 100? Uh, forget all the details. Check yeah. with your, your, yeah, your person with your who knows how to do that. We're just <laughs> talking about brokering for you. So that's all. If you, if you need to buy that house, go to a rebate. Exactly. 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 You you back. One question I do want to ask you guys. So this is advice to the average person looking to find a buyer's agent what's the one thing that, no matter what they're using that you think that tip that you have for a customer working with a buyer's agent to get the most out of them first of all if the buyer agent doesn't tell you how much they charge right up front run period because mm -hmm. then if they do then as you talk with them hopefully they understand what what you need to do to be able to make an offer if they don't tell you to get a fully underwritten pre-approval, run. You got to be super prepared for the market. If they're not going to share with you agent to agent notes and any disclosures up front, even before you see a property, run. Look at the reviews, look on their site, Zillow, Google, wherever. Um, you know, take them in context. They look like, you know, there's 
people doing reviews where it's just, they pay people to do them, but you can tell if they're real or not. Um, you know, it's just, are you getting the value? If this person says they're charging you two and a half percent on $3 million, why? Mm-hmm. How are they worth it? They took a course and a test and a little continuing education and they have a license. By the way, let's start speaking of taking tests. This guy took his test twice now as a salesperson and now a broker. He is now a broker. So congratulations for it. Congratulations for that. From, from brokey to broker. Um, <laughs> when, so, you know, Drew did ask, you know, one thing, so I'll keep my side of things. Well, I have one, I have comments. <laughs> so I'll keep my nice and short, but so I, I think there's in our industry, I think we do a, a part of our value is, you know, quote unquote, you know, being likable, right? If, if people don't like you in the industry or they, they just don't want to work with you, they won't work with you. That's just the realities of where real estate is. Um, and I think then one should take note that if someone's being a little too nice to you and they're just being like, oh, let's go see this house. Mm-hmm. A little too salesy. You should kind of the red flies kind of roll, yeah. roll over. Yeah. Because the reality is when you want someone to negotiate for you, they should be pretty stern about that, right? There should be a tune of like, okay, I can, I can actually nego- negotiate for you and it won't just be overly nice because what's going to happen? Like always think about how they're going to react to an offer. Right. If they're really nice to you, you know, imagine they get to talk with an angry agent and they're just going to just back off and just, you know, uh, be a, be a yes person and then just make you overpay. Right. So it's all about like, remember that you're working with someone that's going to negotiate for you. You want someone that's actually going to be able to negotiate for you. not just overly nice. You know, yeah. Like, they're, they're, they're two things. Uh, number one, there's. There's like a thing, at least years ago when I had a regular broker, it's just like, let's try to make friends with our buyers and keep in touch and blah, blah, blah. It's like nothing personal, guys, but we all have our own lives. We don't need to have everybody be our friend. You're not sending yes, out holiday spring. fruit baskets? Yes, we don't send out, we don't do anything like that because we don't want to bother you. You know, it's just... It's just goofy. We, if we're going to send anything to you, it's going to be really good information that you can use. That's or the only reason. Or a fat rebate check. Is that too? <laughs> yeah. And one other thing is ask them how they're going to communicate with you. Mm. Oh, I can text you. Well, you know, there's multiple people involved. We use Slack. Mm. They haven't figured out Slack yet. They just don't get it. And it's the world's best way of communicating this. Are you finishing a beer there, Remy? Water. Drinking like water. Like- it's in a, a nice pro Yeah, I was gonna say it's quite the water stein. <laughs> anyway, so we're getting off topic as usual, but you know, you just gotta be able to relate to the person. And, but number one is what if they don't tell you what they charge, run away because they're not doing it for free. It's the only pay they can No, they don't. You yeah. pay your commission. And that's in our lawsuit. So more about that in our website as well. So we're, we're, yes. we're going to see about talking about this in our law, lawsuit and I'll, I'll give my longer take later, um, in a, in a longer video format, but yeah, this whole idea that the, that the seller pays, it, it, it makes no sense. Oh, by goes. the way, yeah. by the way, this, this is, this is the, the most, this is the biggest chuckle I had all week. The outgoing, basically forced to get out CEO of NAR, the Realtors, National Association of Realtors, uh, said at the National Association of Realtors convention right down here in Anaheim this week that NAR is going to fight this and they're going to appeal. Mm. They took three hours to decide that you were guilty. Okay. You're guiltier than OJ. Okay. Hello. But I guess they got no other way to go. They might as well throw a couple million dollars into legal fees to try to fight it as opposed to paying the billions of dollars, which would make them insolvent. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's looking like that $1.8 billion is going to grow to what, $40 billion or? Oh, who knows? Once it goes billions of, gazillions of billions. Yeah. Because the lawyers who won that case literally did copy, paste, and put it over like 50 states and sued everybody. It's just, it's just silly at this point. You know, I don't I want to talk about it anymore. All I want to do is figure out for the buyers and sellers what they should do next and what their best avenues yeah, are. Yeah. And that's, 
And and I, I can definitely and I, see a, a new round of um, those late night t- TV commercials that's going to compete for mesothelia or for the cl- joining the class. If you've been, oh, I saw one on Instagram today. If you sold a house in the last 10 years in California, click here, you might be entitled to money back. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be the new late night TV. And, it, right. and your orders and emission insurance won't cover it from what I hear. So you're host. <laughs> You're really hosed. I wonder if we could use some form of advertisement like that. You know, if you've been told that um, you have to pay a buyer broker fee. Yeah. Well, the hardest thing is to find everybody who's going to be a seller without mailing them 17 times a month and finally getting to them all. Because we, we're, we're big. We're all over the place. So most of our selling people either come in from leads or from referrals or from buyers who turn into sellers later. Um, so, but hopefully we'll be, Drew will work and get us more sellers. Oh yeah. So. That's, uh, that's we're here. Guest host and lead generator. There you go. <laughs> well, guys, All right, this is long enough that uh, people's yeah, attention is probably gone by now, but. If you're still listening, thank you. Thank and you. It's been the latest episode of We Fixed Real Estate.